Let's get into Pax Emancipation. Sir? All right. The floor is yours. Give this a shot. This is a game uh, with uh, a lot of procedure, um, a lot of linked things, a lot of linked actions. So uh, I think as an initial uh, teaching explanation, uh, we will not hit every detail. Um, other folks might chime in with some important details, uh, but in many instances, uh, during the playthrough, some of the some of the smaller uh, details I think will become evident. Uh, so this is a game where three up to three player positions can uh, represent different elements of uh, British abolitionism. Uh, the red player plays the forces of Parliament, which are imperial agents, uh, Marines, colonial agents. The green player plays the wealthy philanthropists and merchants of London who are trying to export their ideals overseas. And the white player plays evangelicals and missionaries who have uh, their objectives. The game can be played in various configurations. Uh, I think the fullest exploration of the game comes from playing the three-player uh, cooperative competitive mode. So what happens in this game is that the three player positions uh, in the first part of the game work more or less cooperatively to try to achieve uh, their own individual goals. So the different, uh, Edward, maybe you could read your goals for uh, the Parliament? Oh, sure. So here, uh, ultimately, uh, for Parliament, it is create democracies. Uh, I get uh, one plus barrier and zero white barriers, ideally, and one victory point for every freedman, every agent, and factory in the sphere. So there you go. All right. And Jess? Um, I get one. I'm a philanthropist. So I get one victory point uh, for each freedman agent factory in the sphere. But also my goal is I need to have less than 26 barriers on the map. And I guess I should also point out here my early game goal, or the goal to where we don't lose, I think is a good way to put it, is that my admins and my marines outnum outnumber the number of slaver ships that are on the board as shown by the slaver ships out here. That's right. So again, we have uh, these uh, three positions that are all trying to achieve their goals so they can advance into the next round, which is the competitive round. Russ, you want to read what the evangelicals Sure. So for the ev evangelicals, the white player, uh, to pass that minimum threshold so that the game can continue out of the cooperative phase, the evangelicals need to convert uh, a number of slaves into freedmen. And there's a minimum number. That's at least 15 freedmen as Edward's pointing down, these lying down. After that, the white player will be trying to, to influence areas of the board to become theocracies. Right. So we've got essentially sort of two games here. We're all working together so that we can make it into the competitive phase, and then it's uh, every person, every player for themselves as they try to become the best sort of abolitionist. Uh, does that effectively cover the basic terrain? I think so. That's yes. kind of the gist of what we're trying to do really high level, right? Exactly. Right. So I think the next thing to do is to go over the uh, player board and the, this is essentially a uh, worker placement game. And so to uh, talk about money and how the workers actually work uh, is probably the thing to do now. And real quick, so this is the player map that comes with the game, which does a very good job of laying everything out. However, when it's down here, it's a little tough for you guys to read, so that's why we're using the player board for my actions and everything, and then Russ and Jess will be using the regular ones, but they also have this as a reference if they need. Great. <clears throat> so, as you can see on the uh, right side of uh, Edward's board, there are three boxes, capital, wealth, and debt. Uh, there are three uh, workers. Workers here represent capacity. So the workers in the capital box uh, essentially represent three gold units each. Those are the basic uh, monetary unit of the game. In wealth, they represent two. In debt, they represent one. Uh, and so the way this works is when you need to spend gold, uh, you move a worker down from one box into the one below. And you can do that in, in any way that you want, as long as you don't obviously go below debt into zero. Uh, and there is an action that will help you recover all this. We'll go over that when we look, uh, when we look at the actions. 
This is also the place where most of your workers are going to come from when they are moved on to the board. And the general rule is that the topmost worker, a worker in the capital box, is going to be the one that goes on to the board. The uh, philanthropists have an exception to that, which we'll cover in a little bit. I eat cheaters. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the basic thing. Uh, this is basically how you work with the money and how you get stuff out onto the board. Uh, it's probably worth going over the rest of the board now and taking a look at that. So here we've got the whole layout. We've got uh, a map board comprised of 10 cards in uh, a matrix 2 by 5 and this represents the, uh, the entire Earth, right? The entire habitable globe. Uh, each one of these is a sphere. You'll note that each sphere has a category of west or east, and so obviously these four uh, in the west make sense. Also note that the East Indies is a western sphere. That's a little detail that's often missed. In each sphere, you've got these different spaces to, that are for different things. Each one of these small circles is a port, and so sometimes there are, in most instances, there are multiple ports. In some instances, there's only one port. Each port has a space for an admin. This is going to be one of your workers who represents some kind of representative of your group who is sort of in charge there. Each empty black space represents an enslaved person or a set of enslaved person. What do we say? Two, two, two million. Two million. Right, yeah, right. And so what's going to happen is we want to fill these uh, slave spaces with these meeple-like figures. Uh, when that happens, that is called a freedman. So what we've done is we've taken a slave and replaced it with a freedman there. Uh, there are also spaces, so we've got the port, we've got the uh, admin, we've got the slave spaces, and then we have spaces for dissidents. So these are people who are going to stir up trouble and help foment revolutions. They will also be represented by the uh, little meeple figures. So we've got pawns representing admins, meeples representing free people and uh, dissidents. Let's see, we also have spaces in between the cards and some of the cards. Wherever there's an ocean, you'll see these blue uh, half boat uh, icons, and you'll see these are slavers, these are bad guys we'll be trying to uh, get rid of. And they are sitting in between, in the, in the water-filled interstices between these different spheres, that's where those folks live. We will be able to put uh, our own units there, we'll be able to put ships there. It's a merchant man if it doesn't have anybody on it, and it's a marine if it does have a parliamentary admin on it. Uh, so we will be using these spaces in between. You'll note that some, like in the landlocked areas, don't have any room for ships of any sort. So we'll take these off. Let's see. Um, I think, is there anything else about the cards that we need to go over? Just the elephant in the room. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> the elephant represents media attention, and the elephant always points to a particular port. So it's, it's, not, it's in a sphere, but it is one of the ports in the sphere. And what the elephant does is represent, this is where immediate attention is going to be played that turn. We'll get into the elephant movement later on, but in essence, this focuses the attention of the game. This is where you will play, and this is where the game will play you back. Okay, I think that does it for spheres. Let's look at the barriers on top of these. These barriers are these little chits. They come in three different varieties, red, white, and purple. These are all uh, uh, the barriers to freedom, right? So we are trying to liberate these spheres by removing as many barriers to freedom as we can while we liberate as many enslaved people as we can. And so you'll see that there are a different number of barriers in different spheres where there are five barriers. These are particularly hard to crack. In fact, if there's five there, that's a tyranny, and that has a special, uh, special meaning in the game, which we will get to uh, in a little bit. Uh, but we have the, uh, let's see, how much do we want to go into barriers right now and how they play back? Okay, we can kind of skip over this. For right now, the important thing is to note that uh, there are different flavors of these, so um, and they will have different effects when they when they fight back, when the game fights you back. Okay, so that is the the spheres, the barriers. Probably the next thing to discuss is the idea cards, right? So we have uh, uh, this is literally a kind of marketplace of ideas in the sense that Milton or or Mill meant it, uh, and this is a game that that constantly references 
the classical liberal tradition and the thinkers in it. So for this game to have a marketplace of ideas is, I think, it's meaningful. It's not just a, a familiar game concept. This marketplace pretty much works the way that uh, most gamers would be uh, familiar. Yeah, um, most PAX games will they are familiar with the market here, but specifically if you're familiar with PAX Transhumanity, mm -hmm. the way that these markets work, we're never going to actually acquire these cards. These are not going to ever come off this board unless they're discarded or removed from the game. There is no tableau building in that respect like right. in other most of the other uh, PAX games. Yes. Instead what we'll be doing is trying to globalize these cards into into the the splay of international law, right? So there's two splays over here. One is marked Bill of Rights, one is marked General Will. They flush a little bit differently, they churn a little differently, but they effectively do the same thing, which is hold idea cards if you can get them up there. I'll explain later why you would, might want to do that. The cards themselves have uh, several features on them that you want to uh, be concerned about. Um, the most important and earliest of these are the ops. So you'll have these extra actions that you can use if you have effectively syndicated one of your agents to these cards. Maybe we can simulate and that here. You know what? Like here, let me have this, and I will actually show folks kind of Excellent. what this looks like here. And I will kind of cover my board a little bit, but it gives you the idea so you guys can go. see these. <clears throat> a little bit better here, okay? So the first reason why you're going to want to be interested in these cards are the ops that are on the right. So the two symbols on that card represent different actions that you'll be able to take in addition to your regular actions. Uh, and there are several ones of these which we'll go right. over shortly. So the ops are going to extend your actions. This is a game where action chaining is really, really important. Uh, let's see. The next thing that you might be interested in is the firebrand rating, which is the little uh, the number in the red circle. Now, what's going to happen in each of these uh, each of these uh, markets of cards? There's one for the west and there's one for the east. Uh, is that revolutions are going to happen? Revolutions are going to happen out here in the world, and they are going to when a revolution kicks off, it's going to replace one of the idea cards in the market. The idea card that it will replace is the card with the, in the market currently with the lowest red number. So that firebrand rating tells you, gives you some idea of where revolutions might happen. That's important because becoming a part of revolutions will help you chain more actions and get more out of the game. So that's the uh, ops, the firebrand rating. Uh, the other thing, to, there's two more aspects of this card to consider right now in addition to the flavor text. One of the symbols on the corners. Each card has two symbols. These are known as freedoms in the game. The, uh, see if we get this right, the uh, black freedoms are called uh, moralities. moralities. The uh, candle morality represents rational enlightenment ideas, whereas the comet morality, which I will show you in just a sec, represents mystical ideas. The uh, red symbols represent uh, politics. Politics, that's right. And sort of, I see this as more as action in the world. There's two flavors of those. The uh, feather symbol represents. I had this a little while ago. <laughs> I'll get this for you. All right. Well, we can yes. look it up. No big deal. But it doesn't. I mean, knowing that is is not particularly helpful in playing the game. What you really want to be doing is match is using those symbols to match the symbols of cards in the globalized splays here, the Bill of Rights or the General Will. And uh, maybe Edward can slide one up there, and we'll just give you a sure. brief so, example. So give you an idea. Uh, here, we'll do it this way. So if we manage to get this card up here, we'll show you how later, what we've got here are two symbols. That makes a freedom pair. And that is going to be uh, useful. It's going to be critical in figuring out what other cards can go up there and whether a revolution is viable. Uh, a card in the uh, idea market splay is viable if it's two symbols. And we're looking specifically for a lock and comet, which I, I'll be there honest, we there we go, we have one. So you'll notice that those two symbols match those two symbols. That means that this card would be, could, is viable for the general will splay. Okay. The last element of the cards that I think are important are the impacts. Uh, those are the symbol on the left. These are pretty powerful extra actions. 
they're triggered through one of the two ways of getting these syndicated cards into the globalized displays. Right. When you legislate uh, one of these ideas into the displays, if uh, you have a uh, is it if you have a fellow on the symbol on the card? Yes, you will have to have a fellow on the symbol on the card, and then you will get the benefit of, of this action, and they tend to be impact. pretty powerful. Right. Did I get that right? Yes, so that's called an impact. An impact, okay, yes. right. Uh, and since we paused for just a moment, we've, we've looked up. Uh, so Feather, let's see. This is purely for sort of... Uh, for a theme. Yes, exactly. Right. Thank you. Candle. So where the comet is supernatural effects and the candle is natural, the feather represents intellectual freedoms, and the lock and unlock symbol indicates economic freedoms. There we go. All right. So, so that pretty much covers the cards in, in general, right? Yep. I think we got the, the cards covered. We uh, explained about uh, the splays. This is where these globalized ideas are, are going to go. Um, these will uh, uh, have mechanisms, different mechanisms for flushing them. Uh, the general will, uh, once the seventh card is added, the first card that was added is removed, so it can never be more than six. The Bill of Rights flushes when a revolution is put into the Bill of Rights. Every, any previous idea cards are flushed from it, so only revolution cards ultimately will. Which stay. thematically makes sense, it right? Does. It's a new Absolutely. revolution, so all those ideas are either you know impacted or they are somehow they were implemented in yeah. the your instrumental in the revolution, so that they're no longer needed. They're now kind of yeah, you know, they're encoded it. in some exactly. ultimate success. Right. So thematically, it all makes sense. I think that covers, uh, let's see, if there's anything else to worry about. Oh, we have factories we should probably explain. Sure. Uh, so we, the factories are these cubes. Uh, being able to place a factory is really useful because it will uh, make shipbuilding cheaper, which is one of the actions, and it will help you clean up disease. Those are these green cubes or whatever that color Discs. is. Discs, yeah, kind of a lime-ish mm. green. So sickly, a little... Yeah, little right, you were right. Yeah, right. Exactly. Mission accomplished on, on that, right? <laughs> right. There you go. Colored. Right. Uh, and removing those will earn you victory <laughs> points as well. Uh, so you want to have your factories down if you can. I think that pretty much covers... And there's four dice, which we're going to be rolling dice through certain aspects to dictate possibly where the elephant moves, as well as what cards may be removed from the uh, the, the tray mm -hmm. or the, um, the rows. Um, and then the only other thing are anarchy markers, really, on our tableau. So the, everybody starts out with six of these here, and... If you, uh, there are instances in the game where you are called to place anarchy uh, in spheres. So if you are called to do that, you will take one of your anarchy discs and put it on the sphere. Each anarchy disc is worth uh, one victory point for you. So in, in essence, you are regressing one of your victory points onto the game board. Uh, it's a good general thing to, that, to note that just about anything you collect from the board, what you want to do in this game is collect stuff from the board and keep it in your victory pile on your player mat. Those are all victory points for you. So you want to be collecting the barriers, you want to be collecting the slavers, you want to be collecting the disease, and you want to be collecting anarchy. You want to be placing agents, freed people, and dissidents. All to cause revolutions from the tyranny of the stability of how things were exactly. to change the modern world. Yes, exactly. So the basic flow of play here is that you are trying to modernize these spheres by launching revolutions, having them succeed, and making the most of them. When you do that, maybe ever could flip a card and show us what a modernized sphere oh, might sure. look like. Oh, sure. Yep, just because this one's close. There we, go. there we go. And so you get a different look to the card. There are no dissident spaces on these cards because the revolution has happened, and the, if there were any dissidents there, they're going to move as emigres to other revolutionary spheres and cause trouble there. And what happens when a sphere is modernized is that it is more or less set in place, so that if you have any uh, figures there, uh, you will get the points for that. Uh, the red denotes that whether there's, if there's no other agent there, that will be one victory point for red. <laughs> Always a good thing. Right, I, I support this as, uh, as the uh, parliament. The other thing that's going to happen when the sphere modernizes is that the barriers remain set. You can no longer collect barriers anymore. And so you're going to want to be, and since barriers are victory points and they do other nice things for you, uh, as well as keep the game from hounding you, uh, you want to be collecting those barriers as well. So 
it's not just about launching and having revolutions happen. It's about launching revolutions and managing them effectively, which is a real challenge in this game. I think a very fun one. So the general course of play, we're going through, we're trying to place guys, collect things, cause revolutions, make the most of them so that we can modernize as many spheres as possible, make it through the cooperative stage of the game with all three player positions having achieved their goals. Then we get into a shorter, it's about as third as long, as third as long uh, competitive game, and we're trying in that phase to become the best abolitionists we can be. And ultimately, all of this, now, again, with the theme being the abolition of legal slavery in the world. Yes. So that, yeah, so we can feel good about ourselves as well right. in doing good. Yes. Yes. There we go. This is a game where we can mostly only do good. <laughs> and we all agree on the goal of doing good. It's just a question of which flavor of good we want. Exactly. There we go. So the basic course of play is that each player will work through their turn. We, there's a turn order to this. It goes parliament, philanthropist, missionaries. And each player works through the entire sequence of, uh, of the turn before passing play over to the next player. So if, uh, if you guys are up for it, if you folks are up for it, we can start working through the uh, action phase. Let's do it, ready Good. and prepared, sir. Awesome. <laughs> so the action phase, you get to take uh, up to two actions. So these are uh, uh, these are mays, not must, but there's almost no reason why you wouldn't want to do both actions. First action is a fundraiser. This will uh, uh, get money back up into your coffers. So Edward's going to set up his mat in a way that shows how this would work. Do you want to work us through a fundraising action? Sure. All right. So first thing is you only have money if you have uh, workers or, or meeples, or uh, we're going to call them workers, I think, or uh, admins agents. or agents. agents. Your agents, when they're in the capital, they're worth essentially two money because they can be dropped down one space for one, or they could be dropped down another for another. However, they are worth one when they're in wealth, and when they're in debt, well, they're not really worth a whole lot to you yet. But whenever you take the fundraise action, the first thing that's going to happen is however many you have in the capital are going to drop down to your wealth spot, and that many are going to then move up from debt up to your wealth spot, and then at that point, everybody that's in the wealth spot will move up to capital. Awesome, great. So if I were to do it again as a second action, maybe I wouldn't in this case, but if I wanted to, what I could do is I would drop all of these technically down. I could then raise up to five of them from the debt, and then from there, everybody moves up to capital. So now I have one, two, three, four, five, six, twice, or essentially I have 12 money in which to be able to take actions. Yes. That, yep. that about explain it, right? Yes, sounds right. All right? So that is fundraising. Uh, you'll need to do that uh, a bit to recover your, uh, your capital. Uh, Red here, the parliament player, has a special ability here as well, and that's they can conduct a maritime op. So we'll talk about that when we go through the ops later on. Um, but at this stage, just note that this is each of the player positions has special abilities. This is one of Red's big ones. So parliament winds <laughs> up being the player that uh, sends ships out very often, uh, places marines, does gunboat diplomacy. Parliament is kind of the force behind this whole thing. Coincidentally, <laughs> I didn't vote to be Parliament, but there you go. <laughs> All right, the second action is syndicate. And what this will do is get one of your workers from uh, one of your agents from your player mat onto one of the ideas. And those come from your capital or your highest wealth space are, uh, that has workers. So if all of my workers were in some mix of wealth and debt and there was nobody from capital, they would come from wealth. However, if I had anybody up here at capital, it then would come from the capital space and then go out onto here. Yes. Now, the uh, spe one of the special player powers for the philanthropist or green position is that when they place uh, uh, agents, uh, they can place them from any of their boxes. They don't have to take from the top. So this creates a, uh, a, 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 a large financial advantage for the philanthropist player. So to syndicate, you're going to take one of your admins, you're going to place it on an idea. Let's say we put it on that one. 
uh, and then you're going to have to pay for it. So you're going to pay two coins there. You also have to pay the agent squared cost. That is the cost of any previously existent agents squared. In this case, that is zero. Uh, if Russ puts one down, let me redo this. Now it's... <laughs> then it falls over. Right, obviously. <laughs> Paying two plus one squared is three. And we get to place this guy here. And that three payment would again be, if I had something like this, would be one, and then maybe it would go two, and then either three, or it could be three, something along the lines of that. And the reason why you'd want to do this is so that you can take a multiple things, but first thing you're going to be thinking about taking advantage of the ops or extra actions that you'll be able to take after your action phase. There are other reasons to be on there as well. The third possibility is shipbuilding. And this is going to be important in order to fight the slavers, uh, collect em embargo barriers, and do some other kinds of things. The shipbuilding action costs three. The shipbuilding action is going to cost three gold. It's only two if you have a factory. <clears throat> so you want to get a factory down early if you can. And what you're going to be able to do is build uh, a ship and put it on any of these seaborne interstices uh, that you want. Um, you will also gain some capital capacity. You'll take an agent uh, from pool and put it into your debt column. So this is going to be a really important way of getting new uh, workers onto the board. It's one of the only ways of getting new workers onto the board. And Red has a special player power here, which is that they may also install a Marine, and maybe Edward can show you how you put an agent on there. That would come from the top of his, uh, of his uh, player mat, and he would put that. Without the agent, that uh, empty ship is a merchantman and is vulnerable to attack from uh, uh, the barriers. Uh, with the marine on the, with the uh, agent on there, it becomes a marine and is immune from attack and can start <laughs> doing some interesting things. Semper on its own. Fi, right? Oh. All right. Ooh, uh. I realize it's not that type of marine, but we're gonna we're gonna use it today. <laughs> All right. Close enough for jazz. All right. <clears throat> The fourth thing that you can do is to post an agent onto one of the admin uh, spaces on, on a sphere. Um, and so here's an example in Europe we might be able to uh, do something with. Uh, that is going to be, uh, that has a cost associated with it as well. So in the game, these are known as any action that costs you anything is a costly action. And the, the cost for placing an admin is the barrier cost, which is equal to the number of barriers still extant in the sphere. So in this instance, Russ would have to pay, white player would have to pay two. three uh, in order to do that. And that will come from your board not from here just using correct that, right yeah that's right now if somebody is to post an agent where there is already an agent so say russ wanted to paste that white agent on london there he would displace the previously existing agent and that agent becomes a martyr uh, and he uh, turns into a dissident which would mean we get one of these guys going put in the dissident space and we are on our way to creating revolution and this guy comes back onto the wealth space on your player board, like so. Yes. The other thing to note about this, this is the first action that we're doing, which is an what we call an elephant action, what the game calls an elephant action. And what this means is that, so the elephant started on London, we did our action. Let's say that instead of doing it on London, we, we wanted to do this action in Nantes. Sure. So we've come here. We haven't created a dissident in this case. So in that case, We'll put it back how it was. We'll put that there. We'll bring the dissident back. All right, here we go. So Let's now, talk. here you can see the little port for Nantes there. Now we shift the element, uh, elephant's focus to that port. Now if we had done this in a different sphere, we would have shifted the elephant's focus to the, the port in the different sphere, whatever sphere we're working in. It's even possible that the elephant began there, but and we did an elephant uh, action there, which sort of picks up the elephant and puts it exactly back where it was. Ooh. Ooh. A critical thing, this is sort of a weird thing that folks tend to have a little bit of a uh, challenge with. The first elephant action you take in a turn will move the elephant. Thereafter, for the rest of your turn, every uh, action or op or, or uh, fight back that the game gives you will be in the elephant's port. That's the focus of your turn, essentially, exactly. both 
in your for your benefit for your actions as well as when the game fights back against you it's going to take place in that focused area perfectly okay uh and there we'll talk more about the elephant can move on its own if nobody moves it okay the next action is uh, a legislate action and this is the uh action as opposed to op that will get an idea card into one of the globalized splays. And again, the reason why you want to do this is so that you can create freedom pairs, which will help make revolutions viable uh, and will help uh, get uh, cards into the splays through the ops, the plebiscite and lawsuit ops. So uh, legislating <clears throat> will get an idea up there. If there are any agents that were on that card, they will be uh, divested, which means they will return to your uh, wealth. The other thing that happens if if a card is globalized that uh, let me do this one. If a Clark card is globalized that uh, has an agent on it, then the impact will trigger. So in this instance, maybe we can set this up. Is this okay? Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So this guy, let's say they get legislated, <clears throat> this card will go up into the display. The agent will get divested, but this impact will fire. And there are several of these impact. This particular one happens to be claim a barrier uh, in the elephant sphere that is white or red. And that just FYI is shown right here for an impact right there. Yep. Pretty nice. And we can see here on the card that this is this is an elephant action. Uh, is it? Let's see if I it's a little hard there. to see on camera, but here I will I will try and help folks a little bit. And what that means is that uh, it, that will take place, that uh, removal of the barrier will take place in the elephant's sphere if the elephant has already been moved. If the elephant has not been moved yet for whatever reason, you can point the elephant to any port on the board that you want but then every action thereafter will take place in that port. And one thing to point out for the legislate action, it has to be a viable idea. You want to unpack that a little bit? That's right. So this is an instance, let's say we have Here, a let's, circumstance. Let, let's give it like this. Ah, and perfect. perfect. Out. So we have, uh, let's say this is a situation. We have uh, two cards in the display under the general will. We have a freedom pair of unlock, unlock. That means any card over here in the idea market that has unlock, unlock on it uh, for its two freedoms is viable to be globalized through this legislate action. And so uh, that can go up there uh, if we wanted it to. And the other thing that happens uh, and we would collect its impact. Right. The other thing uh, that happens when you legislate is that you get a, uh, a manifesto, um, or you may get a manifesto. And this would happen if you made a revolution viable. So we'll go into this later on, but if there was a revolution, which is a per special kind of idea card, uh, if in placing this card, you make a revolution viable, then you get a, uh, a special action. Uh, and that is to add an agent to the revolution for no cost. So that is a very useful thing to do. Yep. Okay. The other thing that you can do, so the last of these six actions, is that you can join a revolution. Let's just imagine for a hot second that this revolution is in here. So the revolution cards, we'll explain them in a minute, but the, uh, or how revolutions work in a minute, but a revolution is just a particular kind of idea card. And it has those spaces there which can hold revolutionary agents. In this case, it can hold, it, it requires two revolutionary agents for the revolution to succeed. The revolution also has to be viable. It's possible to get more agents on that card through various ways. We'll go over those uh, in the course of play. So to join the revolution is a costly action, and the cost is the revolutionary agents squared that are already there. In this instance, that's zero, so it would be zero cost. If you were going to add a revolutionary in this instance, there's already a green revolutionary agent, so that's one squared is one, so it will cost one to move there. And that is how you join a revolution. Oh, you may also at that point flip the revolution for uh, another cost. We're getting a little bit into the weeds here, but 
it's, these revolution cards have two sides, and that might matter in terms of making it viable, it might terms, matter in terms of victory points and other kinds of things, but it's possible to flip the color of a revolution card, and that cost is dissidence squared. So uh, if, let's just, let's see, is this the Pernambucan slave revolt? So that would happen in South America. So right now, the dissident cost would be, would be one squared. So to flip this card would cost one, uh, one gold. This is worth interjecting one moment. Uh, you notice there's a lot of different costs here to keep track of. This is worth agents, this cost barrier squared. A very typical thing we've found in playing with this game is it's great to have the overview and have heard that once, but you're gonna be referring to your player sheets all the time for just quick reminders of how much does this cost. Absolutely, and, and that's why I'm pointing to this and I realize that you guys aren't going to be following along with this during the teach, but as we actually play through, you're going to hear us, okay, wait, that costs this, this, okay, right there. So we'll actually be walking you guys through all of this as we go along. Great. <clears throat> all right, let's see. Can we, do we need to reset anything? To get this guy off here. Flip this to its other side. Okay. What's on this? There's a basic and advanced game sign. We accidentally oh, right. set up with the basic sign. Oh, my bad, my bad. Yeah, there is a basic version of this game uh, where you're, uh, uh, you're not using the globalized displays. Um, I think for certainly for this teacher, we want to show the, the whole game in its full glory. All right, so that's actions. You can work through those six actions. Uh, you'll be able to take two of those. You can repeat actions, so you can do two fundraisers if you want. Then you're gonna move to, we're gonna move to the ops phase. And for every agent you have out and syndicated on a card, maybe someone can pop a few agents out there just Might for as well it. use mine since, I'll go sure. throw some out there. You're going to be able to uh, to take ops. So in that, uh, let's do this one here. So uh, the red player's turn. Red player's going to choose has three ops that they can take advantage of. They're going to uh, cover the op that they uh, uh, choose. If red had another agent out there, they wouldn't be able to. to they would. Uh, yeah. So that agent on the same turn could choose one of the different ops, but you can't repeat an op. Makes sense. And then when your turn is over, you move them off. So that is available, all the ops are available for the next player. So you get one of these for each syndicated agent. <clears throat> and there are seven flavors of these. The first is the maritime op. And this is going to be uh, really useful, uh, well, for all players, but particularly the red player. Yep. And what this lets you do is activate Marines. So Edward, maybe we can have another empty ship on there sure. just to show yep. how Marines can move. So let's say we have one there and we'll maybe have one there. There we go. And when you activate uh, Marines, you can shift your Marines around to whatever boats you want. Uh, you can, if you wanted to keep it there, that's completely fine. Either way, you're sort of lifting it up and just putting it down. And then if you're red, <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, uh, and, and then you get to perform a gunboat diplomacy. Gunboat diplomacy is a little sort of subroutine that you'll be able to do. Um, and you're going to do this uh, quite a bit. And what gunboat diplomacy lets you do is, is claim something from, uh, from uh, a sphere adjacent to the marine. You can claim a black anarchy disc if there's one there. You can claim a, a purple <laughs> embargo barrier. Or you can fight a uh, slaver. So to fight a slaver is the only one of those things that is going to cost money. And the cost of that depends on the number of dice you wish to roll. You can roll uh, up to four dice, but the cost is the number of dice squared. So obviously one, it goes one, four, and then on up from there. I'm a history professor, not a math guy. <laughs> <laughs> and that cost, again, the cost comes, as always, from over here. Okay? Yeah. Um, and so that will give you a certain number of dice, and uh, you want to roll them. You have to, what you're Excellent. looking to do to defeat the slaver and claim him is you have to uh, roll higher than the number of uh, slaves in adjacent spheres. In that instance, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, actually it's empty slave spaces, right? Correct. There's only one. So all uh, what we have to do is roll two or higher. Or when? Oh, just barely. <laughs> well, Very no, just don't want to waste it. Yeah, it's huh? all about right. efficiency. You got it. You saved that one. <laughs> <laughs> Say you had rolled a one though instead. Okay, I rolled a one instead. Okay. <laughs> what happens, that matches the one on that uh, slaver, and so corruption is going to happen. 
Boo. Do you, Russ, do you remember what corruption, how corruption... Certainly, real quick, while you're looking that up real quick, a moment, I want to show you guys so here. you can see a couple of the different ships. We have the Barbary pilot, uh, Pirates, which have a single die with a single pip value yes, on corrupting. that, whereas this one here, sorry about that, we have Caribbean Sugar, has four different dice on it, so a uh, bigger... Uh, bigger opponent here to be able to take out these slavers. It's regressing there. a barrier. All right. So if if you only roll one die, this cannot happen to you if you roll two or more dice. If you roll <clears throat> only one die and that number comes up, then <clears throat> you have uh, uh, you found some corruption. And corruption is going to regress a barrier Correct. Uh, onto, uh, onto one of the spheres. And so there are no barriers to regress. That would mean taking one that was had been collected would be put back on there. Uh, so we can't do that. So instead, what's going to happen is we're going to add anarchy to one of the spheres. From whoever the active player. So basically, you're losing a victory point having to put anarchy out right. there. So right. right. So in this case, where, Ed, where Edward rolled a one, he's basically, sorry, failed twice. <laughs> you failed to get a two or greater, and then you also had your roll, which failed, matched one of the dice on that slaver. So this slaver is particularly weak. This slaver is more dangerous. Right. That makes sense. So that is gunboat diplomacy. It's, the, it's a, a powerful way to claim things that are on the board, get them into your victory pile where they are worth, uh, where they're worth victory points. Uh, so we're still on the Maritime app here, and Red has a special ability here, which is that they may install a Marine onto an empty ship from their uh, capital and then perform uh, gunboat diplomacy. So that is uh, Parliament's okay. Royal Navy sea power. All right, the second op is the manumission op. The symbol for this is uh, sh broken shackles. And what manumission is going uh, to do is let you liberate a slave. That means it will let you put one of the free people meeples onto one of those uh, empty black spaces. This is an elephant op. So either the elephant's attention has already been focused somewhere by a previous action or op, or you will now set the elephant to whatever port you want to, uh, where you want to liberate the slave. And then you have to pay the cost. The cost is a barrier cost, which in this instance would be three. And then you get to place your uh, free person meeple down there. And that is worth one, will be worth one point if it survives. All right, so that's the manumission op. It's a costly op. The westernized op is a way to do the same thing, but without having to pay the cost. This, though, requires uh, certain preconditions. You need uh, your admin in the port. So in this instance, red would not be able to do this, but white would be able to do it. Or you need no uh, red barriers, so as if the red barriers had already been collected from the sphere. Or you need an underground railroad. And I think it's probably time to set one of these up. Let's do it from here to here. Okay, and sure. then uh, let's see, what is it? No whites, mm -hmm. right? So <clears throat> what we've got here is a situation where there is no white barrier here. White is uh, right wing barriers to freedom. And it is, uh, we can in, in, uh, typically westernize or liberate a slave if there are no red barriers. But guess, uh, uh, whoops. So let me make sure that I don't mess this up. If there are no red barriers. No, for Underground Railroad, you're setting up, right? Yeah. No yes. white. No, no white, white barriers. barriers. Yeah, okay. No white. So uh, what we can do here is use this Underground Railroad to treat this space, this sphere, as if it has no white barriers. We're just pretending there. So that is the power. It requires a navy or uh, a boat, a ship, between the two spheres where you're trying to make the mm -hmm. connection. And it only works uh, for one adjacent sphere. So let me make sure I understand. Um, so even if it were like this, it would not work here because that's more than two away for an area that doesn't have any white barriers. So basically, that as long as you meet one of those prerequisites, mm -hmm. correct? correct? Which is either you have to have an admin, which white does, so he's good to go, doesn't need the Underground Railroad, or if there are no red barriers there, so if these were gone, then everybody could, any of us could do that, or the Underground Railroad right. is in effect, which is 
there's an area that's directly adjacent to it with no white barriers and has a ship manned or unmanned, then anybody can take that western uh, westernized action, correct? Just transport those. You areas. got it. Right. There we go. And that will cost you no money. So this is the way of doing that that costs you no money but requires some setup. Um, and again, that being an elephant action, though, it does require, as uh, Patrick mentioned earlier, that that is where the elephant is or had previously been moved to or it was the first elephant elephant really yes. elephant <laughs> action of that player's turn <laughs> excellent so uh, the fourth op is the suffrage op this is going to let us claim a barrier so these are things we def desperately want to get rid of uh, by and large and uh, we are able to do that under the circumstances. First, it's an elephant op, so we either have to do it in the preset elephant sphere, or if the elephant hasn't moved, we will set the elephant sphere. Then we can claim the barrier if we have a port majority. Uh, so here's an example of a green port majority, uh, and that includes admins as well. So is that that's wooden pieces of your color in a given port. You got it. Okay. Or you need a, a red admin there, so it would work here in the 13 colonies. Or you need no white barriers, in essence the setup for uh, Underground Railroad. And uh, under those uh, circumstances, you can claim any of the barriers that you want. There is a cost to that. Uh, so this is expensive to get and hard to get rid of barriers. The cost is slavers squared. So you're going to look at all the adjacent slavers to that sphere and uh, square that number. So right now, four, 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 things are expensive. Generally in the course of play, you would hope that the Royal Navy would come take out those slavers, soften things up, and make it easier to claim the barriers. And that's where that kind of cooperative nature of the first yes. half of the game comes in. The fifth op is the literacy op, and this is going to uh, let you create dissidents. And you want to create dissidents because in order to spark a revolution, you need at least one dissident. Dissidents of your color will also give you some, uh, might give you some more options in the course of the revolution. So the way you create a dissident is you need your, uh, uh, your uh, admin on the port in question. And you will simply, so let's say we are down here in Brazil and white is going, they're the admin, they're just gonna place uh, one freed person meeple onto the dissident space. And now we are on our way to fomenting revolution. Just since we're kind of there, revolution, if, it, if there is at least one dissident and one anarchy, revolution will happen during your player turn <laughs> a little bit later. Okay, that's the first five of the ops. The last two ops are Lawsuit and Plebiscite. And these are other ways of getting idea cards into the globalized splay. In this instance, you can only get them into the globalized splay if they are viable. That is, if the two freedoms on the idea card match a freedom pair that already exists in the globalized mm. splays, mm. okay? There's two different ops here because <clears throat> uh, there are two different splays. So you'll see on the Bill of Rights card, there's a hammer that represents lawsuit. Can I interject for a second? Yes. We actually uh, let mess it up. The legislative is, is the action we covered earlier where it must be viable. Oh. Lawsuit and plebiscite, the ops that we're yes. covering now are the options when you are not viable. I made the mistake or that need not be. every player will make a few times <laughs> yes. in the course of this. The, so under legislate, you need this, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, freedom pair to match for the thing to be, for the idea card to be viable. This is the way to get a, an idea card into the globalized displays without it having to be viable. This is in fact the only real way to, to do that. So this is how you create new freedom pairs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Russ. Um, let's see. So this is a costly action. It will. Add, so how this works? Let's see if we have an example over here in the idea display. You want to find okay, a lawsuit? Let's put one back down here so okay. it fills the side. Sure. What would you go. like to find? Let's see a, let's see a lawsuit, maybe. Sure. We have a lawsuit here. We've got a plebiscite here as well. Okay. I believe. Let's do. Uh, no, I'm sorry. We have a plebiscite here. Yep. We got one there. Okay. Let's see. There's a. There's a lawsuit there, right? Yep. So when you do the lawsuit op, you move over, cover the lawsuit, and what that means is that any of the ideas under 
in this column, so we're starting in the west, so we have to stay in the west, any of these ideas is going to be, uh, uh, you can globalize it into the, in this instance, it would have to be the bill of rights splay because we're using the lawsuit op, that's the hammer, here's the bill of rights, that's the hammer. So this card can go over here. Uh, I'm sorry, so this could send one of these cards over here. It would be my choice as to which one goes. Oh, there are already uh, dudes on those things. What happens to those? Those will... Um, That's the cost best. associated is the agent squared, right? That's right. So to do this one would cost four gold. To do that one right. would cost one gold. Mm -hmm. So maybe you choose this one let's unless you it. wanted, say, the feather, right? Okay, so sure. let's get one in there. It would have to go under here where lawsuit... You pay your costs, and then that fellow gets divested back to wealth. That is the, the middle box. Boink. Let's see. And now we have a candle and comet uh, freedom, freedom, freedom pair. pair to be able to hopefully match out here something that's either out there, like, say, this one, etc., to be able to foster Perfect. revolution. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So that gets us through uh, the ops. Uh, just to sort of review again, uh, and to correct myself, the legislate will get, oh, and so while the legislate gets the idea card that you are on into the display, the plebiscite and lawsuit gets cards that are below you into the yes. globalized idea display. Now, do you want to touch on bonus petition to this point or not? Yeah, let's do it. Just to c c convey a sense of this, everyone can always uh, you know, sort of rewind this or whatever if it's, if it's being taped. But th this is a game where there are a lot of sort of extra things that, that you can do. So you want to talk about bonus petition? And I'm going to sure. show folks here. So whenever you take these actions, it shows that you can do a bonus petition. Go for it. Great. So uh, we've just covered, and to review, we've just covered an example where this was lawsuited into the Bill of Rights and it would have operated the same way had someone used a appropriate plebiscite action to move it into the general will. Again, those two ops, the lawsuit goes this way, the plebiscite goes that way. However, the result of it is the same. Once you take this and, let's say, following our earlier example, we lawsuit it into the Bill of Rights, you make a choice as to which one of these freedoms you want to go in. Once you've made that choice, it is essentially permanent. So let's say I've chosen this one. There are two things. We're going to be sliding it under and creating, but I'm just going to leave it out so you can see for a moment the choice. We're choosing two things. We're choosing, as Patrick talked about earlier, the freedom that's creating the new pair. So I'm choosing to create Candle Comet as opposed to my other choice of Candle Unlock. That's great. That will affect our market later. But the other thing that I'm choosing is, in this case, I had a choice between a black or a red freedom. Now, why does that matter? That matters because Writing along with this um, lawsuit or plebiscite op that I've done, I get a bonus petition as a reward for doing something that helps move us towards emancipation. And the type of bonus petition that I get is dependent on the color of the freedom I've chosen. If I've chosen a black freedom, then I get my choice of either a fundraiser or, now let me make sure I get which one's correct. Thank you, an extraordinary legislation. Now, again, there's lots of terminology around these things, but the meaning of that is this. Fundraiser we already covered, and that's one option. Extraordinary legislation, by choosing the black one, is to do another legislation action over here. So I could look around, just like the legislation that we covered earlier, I could look around, find something which is now viable, and look, I've made Candle Comet viable, and Edwards found a Candle Comet here. I could look and say, this is viable. For legislation, if you recall, it needs to be viable, and it needs to also have been previously syndicated, i.e. have an agent on there. If that were the case, I could now immediately legislate it just like normal. If there is no available thing that has a viable freedom pair and is already syndicated, then too bad, I can't take that to any effect. But you can't always fundraise. Can't always do it. Uh, uh, yes, correct. So I could choose, as Edward said, between this extraordinary legislation or free fundraise. Free fundraise, always good. Always good. Now, I had a second choice. I could have chosen a red icon. If I had chosen a, fre a red icon or a red freedom pair, I don't get the option to do this extraordinary legislation. I still get the option to do fundraise. What I can do with the red in place of the extraordinary legislation is I can do nationalization or privatization. Now, if you're red, you get to nationalize. Thank you, Edward. <laughs> if you're one of the other colors, white or green, you get to privatize. And all that means is red, parliament, government, 
they get to claim other people's agents that were on the card that you lost due to the plebiscited and move it into his wealth as he's done there. You may optimally smile, which he's doing right now. He's claimed that and he can use that as part of his wealth generating cycle from then on. Impressment. He, yes. <laughs> he can't use that agent to, to uh, be deployed onto the board or onto the market like he could his own, but he's captured that agent for his own nefarious purposes. That's nationalization. If you're not red, privatization is saying, eh, bring it back home. And that would come back, in this case, to me, and it would go into my wealth. So those are your bonus petition options. It's a nice little example of the uh, elements of com competition that are in this game, even in the cooperative round. All right, let's see. So that gets us through all the ops. So our first thing was to take our two actions. Our second phase of our uh, turn is to go through the ops, any ops that we want to take. Those are all maze, by the way. You're not compelled to do that. The third phase is when the game starts playing us back. Uh, and we're, so uh, we have the elephant phase. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna roll a die, which maybe Edward can do for us now. I'm gonna put this back where it was. Oh, good. All right, so he rolled, he's gonna roll one die, and this is gonna uh, condition uh, two things. One, it will uh, tell us uh, where the elephant moves if the elephant moves. The elephant will not move if you have focused its attention. It will not move if you have done an elephant action in, uh, or op during your turn. If you have not done that and the elephant's attention has not been focused, you'll move it a number of spheres clockwise, skipping over modernized or diseased spheres. And that's where the elephant will go, and it will wind up at the port with the most open spaces. If they are tied, then you get to choose. And just to show folks, if he were already here, he would skip this, go one, skip, skip, two, three, and end up here in Virginia. The other thing that that elephant roll is going to do is if no gap is in the idea market, if no cards have been removed from the idea market through legislation, plebiscites, lawsuits, revolution, six, four, whatever, <laughs> then uh, that three will tell us we'll start down one, two, three, and we'll remove one of those cards that will be discarded. Uh, and it will stay in the game for possible use in the second part of the game. However, if it has one of these arrows, it says cultural diffusion. Western ideas will flow eastward. So instead of going out of the game, it will push that card. It will uh, divest the agent that is on there back to wealth. That card now gets to be discarded and that card will move in there. We do not at this point uh, change the idea market. That'll happen at a later stage of the game. So don't do that yet. So that's the elephant phase. The next phase, this is a game where you get to say hate rolls a lot. So the hate roll <laughs> happens, and what will happen here is the game will fight you back through its barriers to freedom. We will uh, look in the elephant sphere, so in this instance it'll be South America. The number of dice that we will roll will be the number of space, open spaces in the elephant's port. It's important here to remember that the port itself is always uncovered, so you're always going to roll one die if you, if you have to make a hate roll. And then there's another uh, slave there, so that's going to be two dice altogether. We'll roll that, and then we will match that, and we might need to move those barriers yep. up close. Okay, so I rolled a four and a five. Now I will go ahead and bring these over so you guys can see these, and a moment. There we go. So what those numbers mean are if any of those pips show up, it will trigger that dice. So if, uh, if uh, you roll two fours on this, then the, you'll, your two hits against white, because that white is four. And what that means is that in that port, you have to remove, and that if, it, if you roll two fours, you'd have to remove two of your white, uh, white pieces. You can remove an agent who is, uh, would be martyred, and go back to wealth, and would he create a dissident? He would create a dissident. He would create a dissident, which would, so we might, might want to put a dissident there just to show folks how that works. So we, we've dissident. lost an agent, which is bad, but we've created a dissident, which is not the worst thing in the world, so that's a compromise. Or, let's say that it looked like this instead, we could have, and even if there was an agent there, we could remove a freedman, and a freed person instead. And would not become a dissident in that case, correct? It but. just goes back to pool. 
Um, let's see. So that is how the game will fight you. Now, let's say you can't. Oh, yes. Please. Oh, no, no. I was going to say. So if you rolled two fours or a four and a five, given our example here, you would have to remove two of them. Exactly. Yes. Now, if if uh, if there, uh, a one had been rolled, then red would be responsible in that port for removing one of their pieces. Well, red has no pieces in that port. What do we do? Normally, it wouldn't matter at all. But in this instance, uh, some of these dice that we'll show yeah, you. Let, let me give a better has. example here to show the difference between <laughs> these two, because this is a detail that I guarantee will not show up well on the camera. I apologize. So you can see that, uh, oh, there we go, on that top one, the Brazil one, uh, or, mm -hmm. or that one, there is a collared die face and an uncollared die face. The uncollared die face we're not worried about. The collared die face is a bloody die. And what this means is if, if it cannot be satisfied, if it scores hits, and those hits cannot be satisfied, then uh, what is this, corruption, or uh, is there an in-game name for this? Um, for frustrated hate? Frustrated hate. That's it. We have frustrated hate, which will regress an anarchy onto the board, right? Yes. And that would come from the uh, red player, or would it come? Would it would, it come if it from? causes anarchy, okay. yes. So, uh, so that's the way the game fights you back. Sometimes it's not the worst thing in the world to have anarchy on the board or to be creating dissidents. If, however, let's say that same thing happened. I'm going to borrow a couple more here. Let's say we had already had two anarchy on this sphere, and we had this frustrated hate. Now we have to add a third. Each sphere can have a maximum of two anarchy. If a, uh, an, an, a, any additionals spill over or cascade into adjacent spheres, and uh, I believe that's our choice on adjacent spheres. So you can spread this this anarchy. If you're not careful, at the beginning of the game, anarchy can cascade and you will be crushed. Yes. If all players' anarchy are out on the table, if there are 18 anarchy out, then all players lose. Which, rightfully, we should, because that, that, yes. that, that's horrible. Right. We're, we're we have revolutionaries. Not done we're right. not anarchists. Right, exactly. All right. And uh, so Russ is going to check that just to make sure I get it right. Yeah, you're fine. So that is, uh, that is hate rolls. So we've gone through the elephant phase, we moved the elephant, then we've gone through uh, hate rolls. Now we're on to pogrom rolls. So we had hate, now we have pogrom. A pogrom is sort of a, a, a mob, a riot. It's you know, cons targeting some unfortunate group. A pogrom will happen only in spheres where there are uh, two anarchy and fewer than five barriers. These Spheres with five barriers, there's one, two, three, four, that begin with five barriers, these are known as tyrannies. And pogroms can't happen in tyrannies because the autocratic rulers have so locked things down that there's no possibility for dissent. So uh, what happens in this instance, let's say uh, we would need to do a pogrom roll at this stage of the game. And the way this works is Edward rolls one die, and we consult the uh, result. If he rolls a one, then a, uh, a, a white unit is removed, two removes a red unit, three removes a green unit, four through six will add one anarchy, which in this case would have to cascade somewhere, probably to Africa, so we don't have to do a pogrom roll in the 13 colonies. So that's essentially where the game fights you back. Do, do I have anything? Do we need to fix anything? You do. Uh, Andrew made one good point, which is um, uh, we misspoke a little bit earlier about the direction when the elephant does its elephant walk, where it's headed. Rather than being placed at the, uh, at the port with the most open spaces, it's placed at the port with the most freedmen and admins. Ah, okay. No good. harm, no foul. Thanks yep. for the catch, Andrew. Thank you Perfect. very much. Moving on. So that gets us through the game fighting us back. Now we get to uh, a fun part, which is the revolution phase. It's almost the last part of the turn. And what's going to happen in the revolution phase is we're going to see if there are any revolutions to launch. Um, and we're going to resolve any revolutions that, uh, that conclude in some fashion. So a revolution is launched in any sphere where there is at least one anarchy and at least one dissident. So uh, this board state, only Brazil is going to uh, revolt. And what we will do when that happens is we'll go through, I'll let you do this part. Sure. We'll let you, uh, we go through the deck of revolution cards. There's one revolution card for each of the 10 spheres. So we'll find the revolution card for the uh, appropriate sphere. 
and we're going to place it into the uh, idea card uh, market. We're going to, it's going to replace the card with the lowest firebrand rating in its hemisphere. So we're in the western hemisphere, so we're looking to the left column here, because that's the west, as opposed to the east, the lowest number is... Four. Four. There we go. So this will replace that card. Two points of clarification here. One is that, uh, I don't believe we mentioned earlier, you can probably tell that these are decks right here. You can see ahead the top card of the upcoming deck, but it's not actually in the market right now. Correct. And then the second thing is, with this being gone, this will actually get removed from the game. Correct? Yes, it's removed from the game rather than put into the discard. Yes. So you can't see it again. So now we have a revolution card. Now, there's two sides to these cards. One side is red, which is its civil rights side. And the other side is white, which is its slave revolt side. The card will go in, um, the color that it will Dissent. go in is dependent on the max, on the, who's got the, the majority of, or plurality of dissidents in the sphere. So in this case, it's easy. It's going to have to go in on the white side. If there was also a uh, red dissident in that sphere, then the placer could choose which side you might, uh, it goes in. That matters because there are different, um, benefits to the different sides. Uh, each side is going to have a different freedom pair on it, uh, may have different ops, and it may also have <clears throat> a different number of victory points that are rewarded. So maybe we can get a, uh, a close-up of one of the uh, revolution cards and we can see how the <clears throat> victory points appear on the cards. So if that candle is put in, it is if you manage to globalize that revolution card such that the candle is, uh, is, is showing, then green at the end of the game earns one victory point. If it went on on the other side, it would now be worth two to red. And then there's a flip side of the card where the math is a little bit different. So it matters what side these are on. All right, so we have our revolution card here. Um, Let's see, we will, in this phase, at this point in the game turn, we'll now see if this uh, resolves, if it, is, uh, if it is successful. It will be successful under two circumstances. We need both of the revolutions, uh, revolutionary agents filling it. It's possible to have more on there in, in the course of the game, but it takes two <clears throat> to, uh, for it to succeed. Other revolutions might take three or four revolutionary agents. The other thing that, has, uh, that is necessary is that it has to be uh, viable. You, it has to be possible to uh, globalize this into one of the idea displays. Here we have candle feather, and we have candle here, but no feather, so this is not yet viable. And it, even if all of its revolutionary agents are full, it cannot succeed yet. It can stick around in this idea market, though it's possible for it to flush out of the idea market if it goes low enough and things happen. If that happens, that's just too bad. The revolutionaries then would go back into their respective wealth spaces on their player boards, right? And one other thing yep. I want to uh, point out is when that card gets replaced, any existing agents that are on those cards actually stay on, essentially, and they become revolutionaries. That's right. So uh, you want to be on those, you may want to be on those low firebrand rating cards so that when they turn into revolutions, you will have free revolutionary agents already undertaking that work. Now, if the revolution succeeds, let's uh, add maybe a couple greens on there. Which is worth noting, there are only two spots, but you certainly, if circumstances allow it, you can overflow those spots, two of the minimum. The game, Jess. <laughs> now, <laughs> what gets to happen is uh, we get to, uh, we have a victorious revolution. Let's imagine for a minute that it is viable. We can globalize it. All the conditions have been met for this thing to succeed. Now the fun part happens. We are able to, we are able to uh, take our, our laws for victorious revolutions. And this is where the thing gets really good. Working from right to left, each of these agents and the controlling player is going to be able to choose one of several options. You can claim a barrier, claim an anarchy, or claim a slaver so, in or adjacent to the sphere. So, barrier, so any of these, anarchy, or a slaver that's adjacent to the place that's under uh, revolution. Yes. It's possible to regress a barrier, 
So if we didn't have that white one on, someone could put it back on there. That's kind of a mean thing to do. Uh, but as you get uh, better at the game or more competitive about the game, that's something that uh, can uh, make a difference. You can add a uh, Friedman if there is space there. In this instance, there is not space to add a Friedman. And the reason why you would want to add a Friedman is that the sphere will then modernize, locking in place those victory points that are there. You can post a revolutionary agent. So this is, if this is your fellow who is uh, your revolutionary agent who's resolving at this stage, you can post this person as an admin to, I believe it's any sphere on the yes. board, right? Except for one of the diseased spheres. Unless you already have a factory, or yeah. unless there are other pre-existing constraints. So you can use this opportunity from, of a successful revolutionary to go export his ideas and start his work somewhere else, his exactly. or hers. Yeah, and so the disease, one of the things the disease does, it's worth victory points if you collect it, but it also prohibits you from putting wood down on those spheres. So you can post a revolutionary agent as admin, or you can build uh, a factory, and this is free. It has to go in the revolutionary sphere, and this is a wonderful thing to have because it will make shipbuilding cost two instead of three. It means that any wood you do put down, you can now put down wood in a diseased sphere, and you will be able to collect the disease, and those are worth three points Three points each. And should point Two out, there's only one factory per player, so once it's on the board, it's on the board, you built it, congratulations, boom, you don't have to worry You've about that You moved into again. the modern right. age. Right. The other thing a factory does is give you end game victory points, and those are equal to the number of ships adjacent to that sphere squared. So, worth one point, Worth four points. Oh, sorry, I totally messed that up. All good. Uh, yeah, and so the max you can get from these factories would be would be four. Okay, so that is a fun part of the thing. Although, and it, it oh, you can also globalize uh, this uh, revolution into one of the splays, and that gets you the advantage that we talked about before for the victory points. For the victory points. Oh, I'm sticking this one in. And now red will get two victory points at the end of the game. And it has to be viable in which to in that particular right. splay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, it couldn't go over here because it's not viable here. It's only viable there. And you would choose if both. Mm -hmm. Right. If it's yes. viable in and both. you cannot flip the card side. Correct? Not at that time. There right. are things that we brush by and we can cover as we go through. <clears throat> there are opportunities to flip the card. They're expensive. Yeah. So that's the revolution phase, and then the last thing we do is we uh, refresh uh, the market. The way this works is we start from the west to move to the east, and we're going to move cards down. Um, I don't want to reveal all of these, but we... No, no, you get the idea. Fill just fill yeah. up. Yeah, we're bottom to these. top. If it was like this, though, and we had run out of western ideas, we would fill it from the eastern idea deck, and vice versa. And uh, now would be a good time to talk about how the game transitions from the cooperative into the, the more straight competitive to the end of the game. Great. So what happens if we cannot do that, if we cannot refill all the gaps in the idea market, then uh, the cooperative phase is over. Each player position will check and see if it has met its uh, own particular goals. Which again is, for me, admins and marines outnumber the number of slavers, the missionaries, or the evangelicals. At least 15 freedmen amongst all player colors are out there occupying sl previously slaved spots. And for philanthropists, less than 26 barriers on the map. So collectively, all of us have to have all three of those or we lose. The Correct. game's over. Correct. It ends at that moment. We failed our job in emancipating the slaves. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Worldwide. <laughs> and it's important to play it that way and, and uh, the designer makes a specific note here that um, it requires you to buy into the idea and to play it in such a way that it's, listen, it doesn't matter if I did a better job or worse, if the entire world remained enslaved, I failed. Mm -hmm. Right. Seems reasonable. It does. So that will end the uh, cooperative phase. And uh, assuming that we've uh, made it through and can play into the competitive phase, what happens is that we reconstitute the idea decks. We're going to take the discards, match them with unused cards uh, that we have that were not in play, reshuffle, uh, and then I believe it's seven cards in each uh, of the uh, two uh, decks, and we'll play uh, until uh, until uh, what the idea cards are finished. Is that right? Yep. Okay. And then we're done with the competitive game. And 
<clears throat> here's the interesting thing. So what you're doing now in the competitive game is you're trying to make sure that the barriers modernize in the way that you want. The spheres. Each, I'm sorry, the spheres will modernize in the way that you want. Each player position has a different ideal for how the spheres should be modernized, what they should look like in the end. Uh, let's see, the evangelicals mm -hmm. would like spheres where only white barriers remain. If that happens, we get to score the goodies that are on this sphere. Uh, so uh, we get um, one VP uh, for each Friedman agent or factory in the square, and it doesn't have to be white in order for white to collect the benefit. This is basically a white sphere, so they get to collect the benefit of all the wood that's down there. And uh, white would also get one VP for each dissident of any color that's spread across the board. So we like dissidents if we are white. Red, do you want to read your uh, lower sure. right? Uh, I, for me, it's creating democracy. So I, uh, one or more red barriers. Uh, I want red barriers. I want the opposite mm -hmm. of white, essentially, right? And I get yeah. one victory point for each freedman, agent, or factory in that sphere. So it's the polar opposite. Yes. Uh, it's white versus red in yep. that case. So I get one VP for each Friedman agent factory in a sphere um, with zero barriers. So there you go. So just one zero barriers. I want red barriers. I don't mm -hmm. care if it's one or two as long as we're good mm -hmm. and white gets once white. Yep. Yes. So in essence, what we've got here, this is I think a fascinating aspect of the game is that not only are you trying to, to, to free things, but you're trying to leave the modern world in the shape that you like it. So uh, white evangelicals are, want to leave theocracies. We want to leave these certain right-wing barriers in place. Uh, red, the forces of parliament want to, re, uh, want to leave, uh, make these democracies. Uh, and uh, the philanthropists don't want any barriers in there at all. So they're not, they sort of want a balanced condition in the end. I just think that's sort of fascinating. You get to shape the modern world that you create. Okay, so, and that is how competitive final scoring would happen. The only thing that I, last thing I want to point out is we talk about the first part of this game being cooperative, which it is, because <laughs> collaborate. we have to collaborate and make sure that all three of us reach our goals to be able to make it to the end of the game. However, it's still competitive during that. Like, I'm going to be doing things, setting myself up and getting these tiles and getting these pieces off the board to be able to accumulate victory points for myself while also helping the greater good. Yes. So it's not fully cooperative in that regard. Yes, depending on your play style, it can become quite competitive. Right. <laughs> All right. I think that about covers it. I think it does. So